So welcome to our Saturday night service. Just have a few announcements to make. Uh, in your bulletins, you were given a, a list of food items that the Helping Hands Food Drive is collecting. For the month of August, our featured ministry is the Helping Hands Food Pantry. Now, it's no surprise that uh, things are a little higher priced at the grocery stores. Everybody's experiencing that. And consequently, the food pantries uh, around our, our community are experiencing that as well. People aren't giving as much. And so uh, some of us happen to be in better shape than others. And so I would encourage you to take a list, look at this list. And when you go to the grocery store, see if you can populate a few extra items in your grocery cart. Bring them to services. We've got the box over there. We collect them. And Patrick and Donna would be grateful for everything that you can bring. And, and just for the record, in case you didn't know this, every weekend they go somewhere to a store and they collect. Every Saturday. And then they take on Monday that what they've collected that weekend, and it goes to one of the big food pantries here in a community somewhere. So within days of the time it's collected, it's actually out in people's hands. This stuff doesn't go to a warehouse and sit around. Okay, it goes straight from the collection point to the distribution point and to the people that need it. So it's, it's a fast turnaround on this stuff. So uh, keep that in mind when you're giving. It's, you're giving and it's gone. And the need is still there on an ongoing basis. Uh, secondly, uh, many of you saw the list that went out uh, uh, about the things they needed for the backpacks, the, the supplies and whatnot. And one item was left off that list, and it's on every school kid's need list. And it's an Elmer's glue stick. So uh, if you're by the store and you see one of those little displays that they've got little boxes that's filled with all those things, pick up a dozen or a half dozen or whatever you can and, and bring those too because Jim's is going to need those in a couple weeks, within a couple weeks, to fill up the backpack. So uh, they kind of need them now. So as soon as you could get them, get them and bring them. Uh, if you have any questions, contact Mimi uh, uh, or uh, Joel told me tonight on behalf of Sue Blaylock who couldn't be here this weekend, but they need those as, as soon as you can get them. So uh, I know that uh, there's probably going to be 100 or more backpacks, so they need quite a few of the glue sticks, and uh, so whatever you can do to help out with that. And lastly, did everybody get a gear and a card when they came in? A card. Everybody get a gear and a card? Let me see your gears. I want to see your gears. Everybody got a gear. I want to see everybody's hand up. Everybody got a gear? Good. Okay, we're going to talk about those in just a little bit. I just want to make sure you have one. You can fidget with it during the service for now. You just keep it in your hand and fidget with it. It'll give you something to do while we're doing what we do. But uh, have that, and I'm going to explain to you what that's all about shortly. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to come to your house to worship. And, and Lord, we thank you for us being able to come to place and be with our sisters and brothers in the faith, Lord, and uh, to worship you and, and to pray, sing praises to you. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit fill us and enliven our hearts and our minds to the message you have for each of us as your word is read and proclaimed. And Lord, hear our hearts as Freddie and Ellie, a new married couple, lead us in praise to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Yeah, so Ellie will be with us. So Fred and Ellie are here. Newlyweds. You'll be singing for us, newlyweds. Now, the rarity of this is, see, we didn't ask David and Diane to come sing for us after they got married. So this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen very often that the newlyweds are going to come sing for us. So let's enjoy that tonight. Glad to have you all. state our beliefs as found in the historic Apostles' Creed. The words will be on the screen and they're in your bulletin. Let us state our beliefs. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening, church. 
Great to be back here, huh? So tonight's first reading is going to be Psalm 8. Now the Psalms were written for singing, and they were written in the language of the human spirit, rich in emotion and deepest passions. Some are a desperate cry in the midst of despair, and others are ecstatic praise of our provider and comforter. Psalms and their writing were part of ordinary life for the Israelites. And through the Psalms, the Israelites would express their devotion and their thanks to their Lord. This is a Psalm from David, and it expresses his wonder at God's majestic and sublime nature. And it also contains a focus on human beings as well. David is in awe at the splendors of creation, and the wonders of nature are what led David to praise God its creator. And now the psalm. Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the flesh in the sea, everything that swims the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. And that ends the first reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, guys, we did it. (laughs) Let's all stand at our feet. I was just remembering, we were just remembering, uh, wow, we've been here a couple years now. And we were dating when, when we first started singing for Grace Wesley. I, I remember uh, uh, when I got the call and, and be able to share this moment. And so this is a special moment for us. And you guys are family. We've, we've grown through this together. We were supposed to get married during the pandemic, but the pandemic hit. So we, we postponed it. And, uh, well, now we've been married a week and it's been great. <laughs> so, so it's been awesome. Thank you for your prayers. And, and your cards, and, and, and thank you so much for your kindness. You guys are, are, are definitely family, and we, we love you. But uh, So this is, I present to you Elimir Koyoka, which is my last name. So <laughs> She got my last name hooked up. <laughs> that was good. All right, let's, let's, let's worship God with this song called Not Afraid. this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God the still inside the storm the promise of the shore I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first beyond the barren place beyond the ocean way Walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so I am not afraid. We believe it. You keep the promises you made. Sing into the night. My praise will call the sun to rise. Declare the battle won. Declare that it is done. Sing. When I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way. So I Feel 
may be seated. Oh, that was awesome. So beautiful. Well, for our second reading, I'll be reading from chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 1 through 11. Now, Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians sometime around 60 AD, while imprisoned in Rome for preaching the gospel. And the letter is addressed specifically to the church of Colossa, which was started by Epaphras. Now Paul had instructed Epaphras to return home to Colossa to proclaim the gospel. During a visit with Paul while he was in prison, he shared with Paul that for the most part, the Colossians were doing well, but also described how they were experiencing the same problems as some of the other early churches. Certain members were teaching that observing Jewish rules concerning food, the Sabbath, and certain festivals would help the believers earn their salvation. Now Paul was prompted then to write this letter to address those issues, to instruct them on proper conduct, concentrate on the eternal realities of heaven, and challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. And now the reading, pardon me, verses 1 to 11 living as those made alive in Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever brings to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile, no Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And here ends the reading of the second reading the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Man, I got to get used to playing the piano with this ring on. It's a little thick. It's It's banging against the keys. I got to get used to it. I can't take it off. No, I can't take it off. So I got to get used to it. It's so cool. Let's sing uh, Great Are You, Lord. Beautiful song because he's the breath in our lungs, so let's use that breath to sing and worship God. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great, 
I think I speak for everyone that y'all sound better together. <laughs> Let us pray for our offering. Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you provide for us, ways that we don't even know we're going to need yet, but you do, and you provide it. And Lord, we're grateful for that. And at this time, we offer you back a small part of what you first gave us. And we give you a small part, Lord, because that's all you ask for, but we give it willingly. We ask that you accept these humble gifts. And Lord, I ask that you bless these gifts and bless the givers and multiply them both here at Grace Wesleyan. Send your spirit to govern the use of them so that they're used according to your will and purposes. And may the meditations of all of our hearts, wherever we are, in the words of my mouth, be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will stand as you are able and join me as we sing our doxology. God for Greetings, friends. So, we begin a new sermon series tonight, but I want to tell you what the card and all that means. A couple months ago, Annette and I went to a clergy meeting up at Community Church in Boca, 
And there was a fellow there named Mart Green. He's the son of the founder of Hobby Lobby. And Mart was there sharing some things with uh, the pastors, the, the traditional Bible-believing preaching pastors of our area. And he shared with us this GDLT. And what it stands for is Go Do Love Together. And this is something that Mart's little ministry is, is doing around the country and stuff. And I got to looking at it. And I thought, how unbelievably timely. Because it fits in to what we've been leading to all year. I mean, in January, we started the Contagious Christian Study so we could learn how to tell our story. And we learned how, an easy way to tell the gospel story. We got revived and rejuvenated through Easter. And then the Spirit came at Pentecost in a new way. And then we did the sermon series of Who Are We as Grace Wesleyan. So all of that was designed as, towards moving us someplace. And that was all intentional. You know, last fall, Fred said something about, in one of his updates he did to us, about he was concerned about us reaching a plateau. And we kind of had. We, we, we had. At that time, we'd reached a plateau. And so in one of Fred and I's coffee and conversations, like, okay, so what are we going to do about that? Do we shove everybody off the cliff? Or do we figure out a way to climb to a higher plateau? We've got to do movement somehow. And so that led me to try to put together what we've done intentionally all year. And then in May, I run into... Mr. Green. And this fits what we're doing because it specifically talks about going and doing love together. So in the next four weeks, including tonight, we're going to talk about what that means for us as we come from the place of who we are as Grace was, and we know who we are. We're a welcoming community that shares Christ's love, grace, and redemption with all. We know what our ministerial missions are. We're all the priesthood of believers. We know we're going to serve people in Christ's name. We're going to attend biblically-based worship and prayer, Bible studies. And we're going to do all the stuff that's right on the back of the bulletin, our mission and vision. vision. But knowing all that doesn't get us where we got to go. So what we gotta, where we got to go is we got to go do love together. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to talk specifically about what we're going to do as a church. And so tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the go part. And the go part comes to us from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Some of you are familiar with that being the Great Commission. That's where Jesus, when he met the Mary outside the tomb, and he told her, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. He was had intention. He was going to go out and reveal himself to like Paul said, 500 and more. And so Jesus had somewhere told the disciples, I guess something like this, if anything crazy happens, I'll send you a word to meet me here at this place in Galilee. Because you might remember, he didn't tell Mary exactly where. He said, tell them I will meet them where I told them in Galilee. Where did he tell them? I don't know. But that's where they're going to be tonight. Because Jesus is going to speak to him there. And so we're going to hear Jesus' words when they're up there on the mountain. They, they went where Jesus told them to go to meet with him. So let's hear what Scripture tells us about that in Matthew 16 to 20. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And let's hear what the Scripture says. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God indeed. So Jesus met them up there on the mountain. They saw him coming and they worshiped him. But they had some doubts. So what do you think that was about? They doubted him. They saw him killed, right? They saw him resurrected. But a lot of this wasn't making sense. I mean, imagine it. 
You saw somebody killed. You saw them resurrected. And you spent some days trying to digest all this. You knew he was the Messiah because you saw what he was doing. Teaching and preaching and healing. He was doing miracles in God's name. And, and lame people were walking and blind people were seeing. And, and dumb people were talking and deaf people were hearing. It's crazy what was going on. But they killed him. But then he came back to life. Folks, this was crazy stuff. We as believers have gotten to a place where we probably take it for granted now. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, it happened. Scripture says it. I believe it, so that's it, right? That's what some people say. But if you stop and think about it rationally, we would have doubts like whoever the doubter was that they're talking about here. And most everybody that we meet today that's not a Christian has those doubts. So we should be aware that the doubts exist. And that's what we encounter when we try to go and make disciples. I don't think the doubt was in the Scripture by accident. It was a preface for us to be mindful there's doubts. Now, how much of the doubts the disciples actually had, I don't know, because every one of them went on to be martyred except for John. But he was boiled in oil. It's a miracle he didn't die. So doubting was probably part of the deal. And if we're honest with ourselves, as postmodern, post-resurrection Christians, sometimes we have doubts too. We do. I also admit it. It's okay. See, the biggest part of us getting to a place where we need to, where we're going to do what we need to do as Christians is being honest with ourselves. And sometimes that honesty means it's got to own up. Every once in a while I have a doubt. That's that. It's not a surprise to God, by the way. Okay? He already knows what's going on in our head and in our hearts. And if, even if he didn't, he could tell by our actions. There must be some doubts somewhere. Because they're not just rushing headlong out to do what I've commanded them to do. So what's holding them back? Maybe some doubts. But he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Because at this point, the disciples, his disciples, the 11, were being converted to apostles. Because God himself is sending them. And so from that point on, while technically we're all sent by God to do, the truth is we're going to be disciples all of our lives. Because we're not going to reach that place. Where these disciples do, where they laid eyes on Jesus and he told them to their face, go and do. There's a little difference there between then and now. So go make disciples of the nations. Now, back then, there's, there's two words in that that we need to get clearly defined. The first is disciples. Discipleship in that day was akin to what was occurring maybe 150 years ago, 200 years ago. That most people in our country knew well. It was like uh, uh, apprenticeship. It was an apprenticeship. See, in those days, a couple hundred years ago, if you want to be a doctor, you followed around a person practicing medicine. You learned what they knew. You might go to school somewhere, but the only medical school in the country at that time was University of Pennsylvania. And if you're out in the wilderness and you're going to become a doctor, the only way you became one was to follow around the local doctor. You may get to medical school, but you may not. Someone with a lawyer, someone with a dentist, same with a lot of professions. If you wanted to be a blacksmith or a carpenter, or any, you apprenticed and you learned the trade. So in Jesus' time when he said, go make disciples of all the nations, the people clearly understood that these people, they would go, would go make students of Christ. That's the application of apprentice to the, the master teacher, right? You're a student. You're learning. Go make Students, go make learners of all nations. Learners of what I've taught you. Learners of what I've commanded you. And then the other word is nations. Nations is how the Greek gets translated to modern English. But what it really meant back then was all the tribes, all the peoples. It wasn't the nations like we understand now. Like, don't go make disciples of India or China or Russia. It's make disciples of everyone, everyone, everywhere. Now, 
Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience. Those 11 disciples were all Jewish. And they had an understanding of people being divided into two groups. Just two. Worldwide, there's two groups. Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews made up less than a tenth of 1% of the population. And 99.9% .9 were Gentiles. Unless any of you in here are, are people that were born Jewish and became Christian, we're all Gentiles. We're Christians. But in the context of what was being said here, we are part of all the nations. Because at this point, Jesus had been teaching and preaching among the Jewish people. Uh, doubtless there were some Gentiles following around through the crowds and this and that. But this is primarily a Jewish thing up to this point. But Jesus is telling them to take it to all the nations. Jesus just commanded them to take their Jewish thing, their Jesus, their Messiah, and take it to the whole world. He just told them, you got to go rub elbows with all them Samaritan people. You got to go rub elbows with the Romans. You got to go way out, rub elbows with those Arabs and those nomads and all the people running around the deserts and everywhere. You got to go do all this. That alone would cause some doubts, I submit. But go and make disciples of all the nations. And then he compounds it and teach them all that I've commanded you and teach them to obey those commands. And this is where we break down the most the obey part. Because, see, Jesus told the disciples to go out to all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Jewish understood baptism to be a ritual cleansing and not a baptism into the faith. Okay? It was a ritual cleansing. We understand baptism different as a result of what Jesus did. But the Jews of the day didn't. But the Gentiles had no concept of baptism, except in the Jewish thing, if you wanted to become a proselyte of the Jewish faith, you would become ritually cleansed. They'd give you like a little baptismal bath thing. And that would kind of start you into the learning process. But Jesus is saying, baptize all the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the first place in Scripture we hear of what we've come to know as the Trinity. Matthew wasn't trying to totally draw out the Trinity right here. He just, that's what Jesus said. And that's all Matthew's telling us. So what does that mean for us that 2,000 years ago on some mountain somewhere in Galilee, we don't even know which one, Jesus told these 11, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. What does that mean for us? Well, it means most of us are turning off about now. I ain't doing that. Preacher, I've been listening to that for 47 years. I'm not going to go do that. Well, friends, we really don't have a lot of choice. And here's what I mean by that. Whether we actually go out and knock on doors and ask people, do you know Jesus? Do you know where you're going to go when you die? That's not exactly what Jesus is talking about. There's people that go do that, by the way, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus was talking about was live like you're my disciple, everywhere you go, and that will teach people. You remember last week when I told you about when we should be glad? When somebody persecutes us for Jesus' sake? When, when we say something or do something as being just who we are as Christians and somebody attacks us for our faith? Or maybe they quit inviting us to the block party? Or they don't want to be around us anymore. Or they say, yeah, you bring all that Jesus stuff. Don't bring that Jesus stuff in here. We're here having fun. We don't want that Jesus stuff in here. It's going to ruin our party. It's going to kill our buzz or whatever. The reason why they get upset at us, folks, is because we just revealed the face of Christ to them. We brought God's presence in with them. They didn't like it. But that's exactly what Jesus told us to do. To bring his presence everywhere we go. So our choice is this, really. Are we going to be Christian everywhere we go, in spite of any consequences, in spite of how we think the people there are going to receive it? Or do we choose, through our free will, 
Jesus, I'm, I, I can't take you into this party here, okay? I've got to leave you out in the car. But I want you here when I come out because I'm going to sure need you to protect me all the way home because I don't know how much I'm going to drink in there. How often do we do that? Or stuff just like that? Because when we go in there, we're sure not acting like a Christian sometimes, right? Everybody's been to those parties. I used to go to a bunch of them. Just like that. And I would forget Jesus in the car on the way home too. I didn't tell them what I was, how I was acting or what I was doing. But see, if we learn to be Christian, wherever we are, to whatever degree we are, and keep in mind, none of us are perfect Christians, right? We didn't have to be. That was never part of the requirement. Jesus didn't stipulate in any part of this, oh, before you go, get right, get perfect. No. Earlier on, he says, when he sent them out two by two, don't take anything with you. Don't take your tablet. Don't take your Bible. Don't take your backpack. Don't take anything with you. Just go. So that meant they were just supposed to go with their brokenness. Go with their limited knowledge set. Go with their limited understanding of who Jesus was and what it was all about. But still go. He sent them out to go and do. Do in my name. And they went. And it's curious, when they came back, they came back with success stories. Do you think that everybody they talked to just suddenly threw down on their knees and threw their hands up and says, oh, thank you for Jesus coming? Or do you think that most of the people they told it to say, where'd you hear that crackpot idea? I'm not doing that. And I suspect they heard that latter part more than they heard the thank you for Jesus part. But when they came back to Jesus, they told him about the successes that they had. Do we, do we share with, amongst ourselves those successes? I didn't hear any yeses. So we know that we don't, not as often as we should. So I'm letting you know now, Tony and I have cooked up a scheme. Well, we're going to start sharing that in September. We're being very intentional around here, folks, about raising our awareness about who we are as Christians, what it means for us to live into this, and how it's impacting each one of us. So starting in September, a couple of weeks, a, year, a month, we're going to have little short little testimonials, little two-minute testimonials from people in our midst. They're going to get up and share with us where they saw God active in their life or where they were able to be a conduit for God and the Holy Spirit in a situation somewhere. Recently. Recently. So we can start seeing for ourselves, among ourselves, it's happening all around us. And my hope is, mine and Tony's hope is, that when you start seeing it's happening to others, you're going to say, I'm just as good as Christian as they are. If they can do it, I can do it too. And so that's honestly what we're hoping, that more will step up and, and be more willing to share their faith, to speak about where they saw God active in their life, in their world, in their interactions with other people. Because see, that's where we see God these days. That's where other people see God these days. When we're making disciples of the world, we're only doing it because they see who we are and they see something about us that's not really of us. For most of us, the best we could manage is the, who, the person we were before we found Jesus. That's the best we could do on our own. And that's why when most of us got here, we were on our knees. We were hoping, we were hoping against hope that something in this church or in a church was going to impact our lives and make it better because when we got here, it was a mess. It was terrible. Our hearts hurt. Our brains hurt. Our relationships weren't working. Our friendships were broken down. Our job life wasn't that good. Something. Things weren't working when we got here. Something wasn't working. And we found what we needed to allow us to cope and move on. And friends, that's discipleship. That is discipleship. Coming in amongst the body of believers and finding whatever that is that God wants to give you and give someone else so that they can start moving into that transformed state that Jesus promises all of us. I'll send the Holy Spirit to be in you. I will be with you until the end of the age. 
And that means until he comes back. So we have the most assuring verse of Scripture right there. Matthew 28, 20. I will be with you till the very end of the age. I don't know about y'all, but for me, that's like the most comforting piece of Scripture there is. Jesus promises to be with me to the end of the age. Whether I'm leaving in the car when I go into a party, or whether I'm at the house and I'm leaning on my kitchen counter saying, God, you got to help me with this because I just can't do it. I just can't do it. And I need you to do it for me. And that's when Jesus shows up. He's waiting for us in those moments. He, he's waiting for us to have those moments and come to Him. But we don't have to wait for those moments. We can come to Him anytime, all the time. If we're happy, what are you so happy about? Jesus is with me to the end of the age. What? Well, it just makes me happy. It may not make you happy. It's making me happy. It could be something as simple as that, folks. It doesn't have to be anything super special. And so we have the gears. And the way Mark Green explained the gears was this. A gear is a piece of, machi of a machine. And by itself, a little gear is just a piece of metal. Just a little gear. It won't do anything by itself. But you put a gear with another gear, hook a chain to it or a motor or something, now it'll do something. Do some work. And the gears do a funny thing besides bounce on the floor. Gears do a funny thing. They multiply the power of whatever's fed into it. They multiply it. Each one of you got a gear today. And I want you to put that gear in your pocket, hook it onto your key ring, Clip it on the side of your purse. Put it somewhere where you see it every day. Carry it with you. Make sure you can see it, though, so you, you know where it is. So if you have it in your key ring, it's in your pocket, fine. If you have it clipped to your purse, you can see it, fine. But make sure it's someplace where you're going to see it through the course of the day. And here's what it's telling you. By yourself, you can't do anything. But with Christ who's with you till the end of the age... You can. See, we think when we hear that go and make disciples bit, we're sitting there thinking, got to go do this. Preacher wants me to go do this. But see, I don't, I'm not asking you to go do it on your own. Neither is God, neither is Jesus. He's saying, I won't be with you. And not only that, you know there's a whole room full of people here and tomorrow morning. They're doing it with you. And friends, over the next four weeks, we're going to learn about going and doing love together. But today, we need to be crystal clear. Jesus said, go. It's totally unambiguous. Crystal clear. Go and make disciples. Teach them what I commanded you. Teach them to obey my commands. And I will be with you to the end of the age. We're not doing it alone. We're not doing it by ourselves. And others in our family are doing it too. And we're going to be sharing that with each other. We're going to build each other up. We're going to encourage each other. And we're going to do our part, friends, to build this faith community in this place, in this community. We're going to be the light on the hill we're going to be that place that people talk about. They must follow Jesus because they love each other in a crazy way. And we're going to invite people in to come get them some. Because that's what it's all about. But this week, it's about go. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, every Tuesday night, a Bible study, and usually it's a pretty structured Bible study, a verse out of Matthew, I think we were just doing, and the, but the last Tuesday of the month, we always do a prayer time, where we don't do any Bible study, we just do a prayer time. And this last Tuesday was um, a different one. 
normally it's pretty structured. You play, pray for a little while for the world, and then you play for your country, and then you pray for your city and your county. Uh, but we just prayed last time um, for how we are dealing with, as a church, uh, our prayer life and the people that uh, we know and how it's impacted them and the things they're going through. It's kind of an inward time, but you know, I felt the Holy Spirit in the room like, like I haven't felt before. It was a very warm time. People were emotional. They were opening up, maybe for the first time in a long time, about how their prayer life really was going at home and how we could make a difference as a church and as a community. Some people had already felt that warmth from the whole group praying at one time for them. So I, I, just, I just wanted to let you know that uh, if you want to come on a Tuesday night for our prayer time, and if you really want to catch the last Tuesday of the month for a, a, a corporate prayer, uh, it, it was a pretty warm experience. It, and what it told me is that uh, every step of the way, we seem to be all of a sudden we're, we're like a church. You know, we started this thing as an experiment. We started with there were a lot of doubts. There wasn't any certainty to it. And now we've developed to a point. It's taken us a couple of years. I could have asked God to move a little faster. But uh, here we are, and we're here to, tonight. We're here tomorrow morning. We're praying together. We are a community. It's, it's a warm, wonderful feeling, and I see nothing but doing the next right thing, good things happening to us. One of those good things is um, Willie and Joel are going to be baptized here in a month or so, and that'll be our first baptism. <laughs> Now, that's what churches do, right? It's wonderful. Um, part of the prayer life, though, in last week, you noticed that we had several people in our congregation that we've been praying for. Uh, last, this, this week, Mary Jo uh, passed away, uh, Holly's mother. I think you all probably know that by now. Uh, every, all those of us that come on Sunday morning, we just get a, a warm. I mean, it was such a joy every time. She'd get here early because... Holly would bring her early, and her spirit just took over the room, even if she was the only one in it. <laughs> it was just phenomenal. And, you know, there's a person who would never have wanted to live a life where she was paralyzed or was dependent and there was no hope. She was ready to go meet the Creator. And you could tell it in her, in her mannerisms, in her voice, in her message that she sent. Uh, we miss her already a lot, uh, but... Mary Jo's in a very good place, so we feel very confident about that. Uh, next uh, Friday, uh, August 8th at 11 o'clock, uh, there will be a ceremony of celebration of life in the sanctuary, and then we're going to move over here afterwards. So, August 5th, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, August 5th. So those of you that feel called, sure, uh, please come to that, because uh, we all remember Mary Jo and would love to celebrate her life. Uh, we prayed last week for Sandy Bourne, and Sandy had surgery this week, and actually the news is pretty good. Uh, uh, things have been removed and sent to the pathologist, but I think uh, we're going to get some good news on most everything. She recovered well from the surgery, and uh, there's a long road in front, but i got to feel great that uh, Sandy made it through the surgery, and she really thanks us all for our prayers and everything. We've been praying for Barbara Timmerman, and we need to keep praying for Barbara and Doug. Uh, Barbara came to service last Sunday and looked great, uh, had that same wonderful attitude, and I know that uh, she's going to be going through some times with some biopsies and things, so be praying for Barbara and Doug. We've been praying for a long time for Bill Carey. Those of you that know Ann and Bill from the previous church and our previous time together, um, Bill was, has been a fighter for quite a while now, uh, and He's still fighting. I think right now the thing we need to pray the most for is for God to relieve some of his pain. I think he's fighting some pain. And uh, they've been able to manage the cancer, but uh, the pain is being becoming a real problem, so we want to pray for that. Last week we prayed for Dora. I see Dora's here tonight. And uh, yay. <laughs> I understand that Dora's going to have a little minor procedure or a procedure on your eyes next week. So we'll be praying for you. Is uh, What day is that going to be? Wednesday? Tuesday. Okay. Okay, Tuesday and more tests on Wednesday. So um, let's certainly be praying for Dora. The Porters, uh, Kathy and Gary, are here tonight too. Gary uh, came through and is 
Doing great, by the way. He was hospitalized for a couple of days. Now doing great. They're going to have a celebration of life on the 13th for, um, for Kathy's sister, Lori, and for a nephew. And so everyone's invited. It's going to be in the sanctuary, and then you can come over here afterwards. So um, we certainly uh, we want to be praying for them and, and uh, be involved any level you want to be. So join me in a word of prayer, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Father, a few weeks ago, these things seemed to be almost impossible to deal with. We were overwhelmed. We, we needed your help in everything to, to bring all this together, and I just feel a comfort level that you've been involved in all the healing and all the procedures and all the doctors and everything that's going on. Not everything is going to turn out the way we wanted, but I just know that the Holy Spirit is guiding and direction, directing us, and that Grace Wesleyan is playing a part of that as a family and as a community. We thank you for that. We just thank you for staying with us as these next few weeks go by. We know we're praying inwardly right now, and we'll be praying for the world and for the, our country. But right now, we've got a lot of healing to do and a lot of procedures to do with our community and with our family, our church family. We say all these things in a prayer, and just like your son taught us to pray as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. I'd like for you and Ellie to come and kneel with Ray here. We want to pray over y'all and your new marriage. If you, wherever you're standing, just you extend your hands to be on them. Lord, we thank you for this union that you have wrought between Freddie and Ellie. Lord, Freddie has been a, an integral part of the growth of our church. You brought him to us two years ago, Lord, and what a blessing he has been to us. And when Ellie comes, the blessing is just increased. 
And Lord, we're so thankful for them being here and uh, that you brought them together and they're now together as a family, as part of our church family. Lord, we ask that you bless their marriage, bless them with years beyond years, joy beyond joys, and blessing beyond blessing. Lord, let them, let them experience the, the joy that you pour out that's more than their hearts can hold. And when it pours out of their eyes, let, it know, let them know that it came from you. Lord, bless them in all they do. Give them deep love for each other, solid commitment, and let them be a beacon to the community of what a couple that God has brought together should be like. We thank you for making them part of our lives, and may we be a part of theirs. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 And we have a few things for you from folks that have brought. I'm going to give them to you. Okay, so you can just take care of those. Friends, take your gear. Serious business. I'm going to ask you where they're at next week. You're going to have to show them next week. So I hope you don't lose it this week because you've got to bring it back. But look at it. And remember, you are a gear in God's machine spreading discipleship and the gospel message here now and even if you're by yourself in the moment you're not alone because Jesus is with you to the end of the age and while you're contemplating that may God just walk right up and reveal to you where you can be the hands and feet and heart of Christ to a world we know is in desperate need of his love friends go in peace amen